Is it working? Well, yes and no. You're on my phone, but not my computer. Yeah, no, that's that's how it works. Instagram leave it. It's uh, a little complicated for for most people. We have to to go on with this uh, with this format because it's it's better for for the people who are only we are interviewing uh, like personally instead of doing a a debate or doing something else. Uh, I. I can barely hear you this way. Um, Do you hear me better now? Oh yeah. All right. So it's my it's my microphone. All right. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Hugo Tornayolo Silva. I am the Hispanic America correspondent for Navarra Confidencial, and today we're going to interview. Again, Mr. Charles Coulomb, who is, I think, the most famous American monarchist in the <laughs> last decade. <laughs> and we're going to talk about uh, legitimism and integralism, which are two currents in the political Catholic thought. And especially in the monarchic thought. So, well, thank you, Mr. Coulomb, and welcome to the channel again. Thank you. Great to be back. So, uh, well, we shall begin with a, a quick introduction of yourself so you can tell us or, or viewers, uh, or viewers and your viewers, uh, who are you and what do you do? That's a hard question. I turned 60 and I was born very early on. So I've got 60 years of living behind me. I'm a writer, a lecturer. Um, right now I'm uh, both writing and lecturing full time. And I've gone back to school. I'm working on my master's in sacred theology at uh, the International Theological Institute in Trumau, Austria. And um, thanks to uh, the COVID monster, I'm uh, trapped in uh, Austria for Christmas. But there are lots worse places to be trapped, believe me. Well, thank you. So you have written a lot of books on... Well, on monarchy, on uh, the history of the Catholic Church, and on the history of Catholic monarchs, such as uh, Blessed Charles of Austria, which has your, your same name, Charles. And, well, uh, there was an article I read that you wrote for Chronicle magazine a, a while ago in which you talked about uh, legit legitism, legitism, <laughs> which is a current in... Uh, in monarchism, especially for the for uh, Catholics, so I would like you to to talk a little bit about the, what legitism is. Well, that's a good question, uh, and there are several. As is always the case with politics that aren't socialist, uh, there are a lot of different words flying around. We have to try to make sense out of what they mean. Uh, royalism is the support, of course, of a king. Monarchism is support of a monarchy. And then there is legitimism. Now that has two faces, really. Uh, on the one hand, there's the obvious meaning of the term, which is the support for the legitimate monarch. That is to say, for the a particular dynasty of a particular throne. So uh, the older line of the House of Bourbon in France the Carlists in Spain, uh, the Miguelists in Portugal, um, during the time of Admiral Horthy in Hungary, the Habsburgs in Hungary. In other words, support is not just a monarchy as, a, as an institution any way imaginable, but as specifically attached to a particular dynasty. But that's only one half of it, because uh, as it's worked out historically in Europe and elsewhere, uh, there's an ideological side to it. The, um, to, to, typically, the older lines of a given family, whether it be the, the Stuarts, the Jacobites in, in England and Scotland and Ireland, the Carlists and all the rest of them I mentioned, um, tended to believe in traditional monarchy. Uh, that is to say, a monarchy where, number one, 
the Catholic Church had pride of place and was the animating philosophy of society, giving both legitimacy and authority. Uh, secondly, a, uh, a monarchy where the king was an effective element in governance. Uh, in constitutional monarchies that we're familiar with today, Britain, Spain, the Netherlands, etc., uh, you've often heard the phrase, the king reigns but does not rule. Uh, that is not at all the way a, legitimate, uh, a legitimist monarchy functions. Rather, the king is an executive figure, not unlike the president of the United States. Uh, the difference being, of course, that unlike the president, he's not elected, and he derives his authority through heredity, and through the, uh, the blessing of the church. The third portion of it, uh, and again, these, they differ in details, but vaguely these elements are common to them all. Uh, the third portion is what an earlier age would have called provincial liberties, uh, local liberties, what the Carlists called uh, fleros. And uh, there are different names for them. But Basically, the, the governance uh, being exercised as low level as possible. And today, the phrase we use for that is subsidiarity. But it, it covers roughly the same thing. Uh, the fourth part was the idea of the, of the nation as a family, as, a, uh, as against class conflict, uh, class cooperation. So you had all sorts of names for that. Uh, various ideas, corporatism, solidarism, distributism, guild socialism, all of which referred to different aspects. But they all basically came up with the notion that uh, the nation should function as a family, not as a, uh, as a, a band of fighting uh, squalling factions, and that the king would give unity like a father to them. And then lastly, there was the idea that uh, all of the Christian nations uh, vaguely belong to one Christendom, one sacrum imperium, if you will. Um, that's sort of a, not so much a fifth point as a half point. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, uh, there was the idea that, that there was a family of Christian nations. Now, exactly how that would work out, that was another story. But nevertheless, that was the supposition. So, more or less, virtually every uh, legitimist group had that kind of a program attached to its adherence to the older line of the, of the royal family. And that in a nutshell, is legitimism. Well, there are two things with uh, legitimism that uh, makes it a uh, so interesting movement in, in the history of in the history of Europe. Uh, first of all, is that uh, most of the I think all of the legitimist groups were Catholic, and the other one that was that uh, they didn't support an absolute monarchy or any kind of modern monarchy uh, derived from uh, the work of, uh, of the Enlightenment. But that traditional monarchy, I think that you already covered the, the part of what that traditional monarchy is. But I would like you to talk a little bit about why legitism, legitimism was so tied to, to the Catholic Church. Well, for a number of reasons. I mean, you know, it's why is the priesthood so tied to the Catholic Church? Well, <laughs> I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. That's a big connection. Uh, maybe not so much today as formerly. No, uh, the, uh, the truth is that the, there has never been a monarchy of any kind anywhere in the world throughout the history of mankind that did not claim some connection to whatever that society held to be the divine. The idea of an atheist monarchy, though there have been atheist monarchs, Frederick the Great comes to mind, and there have been atheist monarchists, uh, Bolingbroke comes to mind. But there can never ever be a thing, such a thing as an atheist monarchy. It just doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, Christian monarchy, and that's 
remember, legitimism really, perhaps more or less unconsciously, wanted to carry on the monarchical ideas that dominated Europe for most of its history. And where did those ideas come from? Well, ultimately, strange to say, the Christian, the Catholic idea of monarchy, comes from the vision of Christ the King. Uh, you could say that at the Last Supper, uh, our Lord united the Davidic kingship to which he was heir with the communio of the church. And this Respublica Christiana that was created uh, was given kind of a body when Rome, when the Roman Empire became Christian. Uh, and that, incidentally, was not under Constantine, who uh, gave us toleration and was Catholic himself, but under Theodosius the Great, 376 AD, the Edict of Thessalonica, wherein uh, Catholicism became the religion of the empire, and baptism made you not just a member of the church, but also a Roman citizen. Now, mind you, uh, the Armenians, the Ethiopians, and the Georgians, I, I mean the one on the Black Sea, not the, not the one north of Florida in the United States, uh, just to be clear, we're not talking about Atlanta, but uh, they actually sort of pioneered Catholic monarchy before Rome, the Christian monarchy. But um, that pattern remained the same up until, uh, even, even in, amongst the Eastern, uh, the, the Eastern schism, that pattern remained the same until the Protestant revolt, when the various Protestant nations uh, basically made their state churches departments of state, so that the, the church was no longer the conscience of the king, per se. Now, mind you, there were exceptions to that, and there were some Protestant kings who were sort of Catholicizers. Uh, and again, Charles I of England comes to mind. Um, uh, Gustavus III of Sweden, people like that. Frederick William IV of Prussia. But by and large, there was a real revolution in the notion of monarchy. And in response uh, to that, the Catholic kings took more and more control of the church in their country. And unfortunately, or otherwise, um, the, uh, that and the rise of the modern state was what began what we call absolutism which is not the same by a long shot as traditional monarchy. But even there, uh, there's a point I need to make, and that is that we talk about absolute monarchy. The truth of the matter is, is that we live under uh, an absolute government that can do whatever it likes. It can close the churches, it can keep us in our homes, and it can have us wear masks. Uh, my little joke is that when... Uh, when they had us put on our masks, they took off theirs. Uh, and we live in a post-democratic era. So no, uh, no absolute monarch of the past uh, ever claimed the right or the ability to change, say, the nature of marriage or the definition of a human being. Even Henry VIII, you know, he might kill his wives, but he had to go through a form of divorce first. <laughs> He couldn't, he couldn't alter the law the way our masters can and do. I mean, they're celebrating uh, right now in Argentina, they're celebrating abortion. What they're celebrating is the right of the state to redefine what a human being is. And that is an absolutism that is far, far nastier and far more powerful than any, any monarch who ever claimed to be Christian of any kind claimed. So th this is one of the things that makes me giggle when I hear would-be Republicans yap about, oh, the monarchs were despots. You live under a despotism, my little munchkins, and you don't even notice it. So tuck up and enjoy. Well, uh, you talked about the Respublica Cristiana, the concept of a, of a, Christian, re of a Christian Respublica. And uh, how does uh, that is different to, to a modern republic or to a monarchy in any sense? Because the, the concept of, of Respublica Cristiana 
is a very very old and doesn't relate too well to to the modern conceptions of mo of both monarchy and uh, republic. Well, that's very true. It doesn't uh, it doesn't reflect the modern state at all. And there, you've got to understand a few things. First and foremost, I think we have to look at a, uh, a couple of concepts that. Um, how do I put it? Uh, how do I put this nicely? We have to look at a couple of concepts we've forgotten, uh, sadly. And uh, the first of these, and they're, they're very key, the first of these is really and truly the difference between authority and power. Now, authority is the right to say what ought to, uh, what ought to be. Power is instead the uh, ability to make things happen. So to give you an example, if I'm your doctor, I have the authority to tell you what to do. I don't have the power to make you do it, you see? Yes, yes, yes. Oh. I, uh, All right, uh, we have a... We have, go and go and go and we have a little connection problem here. I'm, I'm sorry, we're, we've got quite a... Uh, uh, how do I put this? Got some, got some technical difficulties. Give me just a moment here. <laughs> uh, don't worry, don't worry. You know, it's a miracle we're able to do this kind of thing at all when you consider we're doing it over several continents and thousands and thousands of miles of, uh, you know, I hope that's working. Yes, right. it is. It's working. It's the power. So, gosh, it's recalcitrant. You're going to have to hold the, the badly thing. All right. So the thing is then that uh, the thing is that tomorrow, uh, what am I saying? Um, in the Middle Ages, in traditional, in the traditional Respublica Christiana, authority was concentrated. It was, uh, what's the word? It was concentrated in the king. It was concentrated in the church. Power, on the other hand, was widely divided. Uh, the king had some, not a lot necessarily. The cities had some, the peasants had some, uh, the church had some, the nobility had some. It was all very, 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 very much divided. Uh, and the king was a good king, was like an orchestra leader. A bad king how do I put this? If you had a bad king, uh, you didn't have despotism, although it could make life unpleasant for the people immediately around him. No, what you had was anarchy, as the different elements of the state would struggle for control. That's why during the Middle Ages, you had some real knockdown, drag out civil wars, precisely for this reason. But, at any rate, uh, that was the Respublica Christiana. Now, with the growth of the modern state and the transformation of what we have now, things are reversed. Power is concentrated in the hands of a few. Authority, the right to say what should happen, is diffuse amongst the electorate, the quote-unquote people, which means that, practically speaking, it doesn't exist, you see. Because the electorate are not really a static group. They're whatever you make of them. So I think that the, um, the important thing to remember is that one of the reasons why we have an absolute state under which we live now is precisely because there is no effective authority. There is no universally accepted 
agent to say, no, you don't do that. Bad touch. Bad. Go back to your cave, Mr. Politician. You're not allowed to do that. They're allowed to do whatever they like so long as their judiciary and their elections allow them to do so. So, in a sense, the modern state is very much a reversion of the traditional, the traditional political order, at least in Europe and in the Western world. Could you please uh, lift, lift your mic? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, my, my microphone. So, you're saying that uh, the modern state is pretty much a reversion of the traditional order in the Western world? Yeah, it's, it's, in a sense, it's almost a paradox now. I mean, uh, I'll give you an example of what I mean. Uh, you look at Aristotle, you look at and Thomas Aquinas. They identified three uh, forms of government which they forms by themselves. The one, said Robert Bellman, the best, was money. The second was what they called aristocracy ruled by the best people in society, and then what they called a polity, the majority of the stakeholders, landowners, uh, people like that, contributors to society, in other words, it was a mixed one, wherein you had an element of monarchy, of aristocracy, and of polity. And in the medieval system, with the estates of the realm and all that kind of thing, they attempted to fulfill their idea. Well, they never foresaw was that the, the evil imitations of those three types of government that they identified, tyranny versus monarchy, oligarchy versus aristocracy, and democracy versus polity. They never explored the notion of a mixed government that combined three bad ones. <laughs> and you see, today, today we manage to have both tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy in one <laughs> <laughs> oh, and well, there's also the problem of uh, of social cohesion because you see that with democracy. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, my microphone. Yeah, so in, right now we have a problem of social cohesion because uh, you have uh, uh, the authority so diffused among the population that there's nothing to to create that community or out of those people who have full authority but no power. Yeah. And in here, there, there is the concept of integralism that was promoted by a particular set of monarchists that were, leaded, or that were led by Charles Maurras, the, the famous French monarchist, who, well, I don't know if he was truly a legitimist, but he was definitely a, both a monarchist and an integralist. He, he was, uh, Maurras is a very interesting figure and a, a fat figure because, how do I put it? A lot of the people that uh, followed him thought he was the end all and be all of everything. I don't think that, but he said a lot of really good, uh, good and interesting ideas. So for instance, while he was in favor of a strong monarch, he was also uh, a great advocate, for instance, of provincial autonomy. Uh, and uh, personally, he was a leader of the Provençal Revival Movement, uh, Provençal Culture and so on. He um, was not, for most of his life, a believer. He lost it. And his biggest, if I may say, error was the way in which he saw the in Spanish theorists who made the same error. And, and actually, if you want to look at some of the Russian thinkers, some of them too, where Moras and some of those folk saw Catholicism was important because it epitomized the country. <laughs> the truth is the opposite. That the country was important, is important to the degree that it epitomizes the faith. Us and uh, traditional legitimists. But it's a difference that became less as Moras got older. And of course he converted, you know, a few years before he died. Oh, we're we're having we're having a bit of of technical difficulties. I think that you're back in the video. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you were talking about how Moraz uh, 
became uh, more of a traditionalist uh, with age. Yeah. All right. Uh, what I was saying was that where, uh, where Moras saw the, uh, the Catholic faith as important because of its role in the building of the nation, uh, a more uh, traditional monarchist would see, a more a legitimist, would see France as important because of its, uh, to the degree that it reflected the faith. It's still a small difference, and uh, it, it is in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways it's not. And it was that difference that led to uh, Action Francais, their uh, temporary condemnation by the papacy. Although I have to emphasize it was temporary. And when it was lifted, they weren't asked to recant anything. You know, you'll often hear people say, well, Action Francais was condemned by the, by the Pope. That's true. And the first thing his successor did was to lift that condemnation without asking for any recantation. So, you know, there's that. Um, the, uh, the other thing, too, is that uh, L'Action Francaise is also very important, believe it or not, in the history of both Austrian and Portuguese monarchism. How so? so? Well, Moras was a, uh, a great influence on the uh, uh, members of the, of the group that was called Integrally Lusitano which um, starting all oh, in the teens and 20s of the last century, did a great deal of uh, really valuable work in terms of defining traditional Portuguese monarchism. Uh, interestingly, in Portugal, the younger line that had the civil war with the older line died out, unlike Spain. So uh, the heir to the throne now, uh, Dom Duarte, is actually the descendant of Dom Miguel, so that's kind of interesting. But the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Austrians also, uh, there was a, a very heroic fellow called Zestner Spitzenberg who found something called Österreichisch Axiom. Haha, <laughs> guess what that was named after. Um, that was murdered by the Nazis. He went to central concentration. Um, again, he used a lot of Morassi's theories adopted to the Austrian environment, and again, also uh, more Catholic than they were with Moras, and was true of the Portuguese. But these ideas were circulating, and not just Moras, throughout uh, Europe between the wars, amongst monarchists of different stripes. Um, and unfortunately, because historiography has been primarily in the hands of the left, uh, to a degree since the end of the war, and particularly since 1968, nobody's heard of any of this. Nobody's heard of a uh, German group, the uh, Gerada Weck and the Weisse Hose, and the, uh, no one's heard of the, uh, the Austrian monarchist resistance to Hitler. And one reason why you don't hear about it is because socialists in Austria were collaborators. And again, since they control the historiography to a great degree, the writing upon history, you don't hear any of this. And I, I don't mind saying that one of the things I've tried to do in my career is to bring this sort of back up to the front. I mean, even Franco, well, sorry? No, no, go on, go on, finish your, well, your explanation, please. I was going to say that uh, even Franco, who could hardly call legitimist, uh, he never gets the credit he deserved for dealing with Hitler. A very, very famous story about uh, Franco being interviewed by Hitler, who wanted him to commit Spain to the war. Well, he, Hitler did his usual Hitler at Berchtesgaden thing, you know, yelling and screaming and all that. And Franco just sat there. No. 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 And then he left. And Hitler told, I forget if it was Goering or Himmler, but he told, I would rather have all my teeth pulled at once than ever have to talk to that man again. <laughs> <laughs> that should be spun it out. 
on, on the other hand, integralism was also influential to, to other <laughs> movements, uh, not particularly... <laughs> Yeah, uh, integralism was also influential to to other movements such as as uh, this uh, third position uh, uh, movements in in Austria, such as the uh, well as the Fatherland Front, which was uh, which actually have a government in in Austria, and to well, <laughs> well, we're having technical difficulties again. And for the for the Brazilian integralists that were not a monarchist themselves, so uh, I well, I would like you to to talk a little bit about uh, about both the the Austrian uh, Fatherland Front and the uh, the Brazilian integralists. Oh, uh, are you hearing me? Are you? We're having we're having a little bit of of technical difficulties. Wait a sec. All right, I think we're we're, we're good. So I I was telling you that. Uh, Repeat the question, please. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was I was telling you that uh, integralism was also influential to the to the Austrian Fatherland Front. And to the Brazilian integralists yes. that uh, weren't that, that much uh, uh, legitimist or monarchical in nature. Yes. Well, integralism uh, is a is a very interesting thing. I can say that most legitimists are integralists. Not all integralists are legitimists. They're distinct. Uh, integralism, where, where legitimism, you might say, got its start as early as the 18th century with the Jacobites. Uh, integralism, uh, as we use the term, really starts more or less in the reign of St. Pius X, um, uh, in reaction when the, the word, the use of the word. Now, Mar now, Moras had spoken of integral nationalism, in which he put, uh, nationalism at the center of his program. But, uh, The, the under Pius X, the idea of integral Catholicism, which Catholicism is the center of the political program, that arose. Uh, while integralist was also used in Catholic circles uh, as, as the opposite. So, so integralist, integralist Catholics are those who oppose modernism. Uh, Benedict XVI, Sorry, Benedict the Fifteenth, rather, uh, the Pope of World War One, he uh, condemned the use of the word integral Catholic. No, we should all just be Catholics. Uh, but nevertheless, the idea of the faith being integral to political and economic planning remained, and that was where, in both in Portugal and Brazil had the rise of the use of the phrase integralism. You had it used in Central Europe, as you pointed out. You had it used in Spain. And integralists basically believe, if you're looking for, again, as with legitimism, there are all sorts of national variants. So, say, with every group that calls itself integralist. But basically, they put the church's social teaching at the center of everything. Uh, and especially the idea that the government state exists for the common good. It uh, doesn't exist simply to benefit the rulership. It doesn't exist to benefit the working class. It doesn't exist to benefit the majority or the minority. It exists to benefit everyone, uh, according to their fair share, as you might say. And this is integralism. But... Uh, a lot of people use the term to mean a lot of different things. It's often used today, for instance, as an insult. So you can't, uh, you know, one of the things we have to, we have to guard against is the use of these words, ways that not only distort their meaning, but are used to further, shall we say, an unpleasant agenda. So I'll give an example of one of, one of this, this sort that drives me crazy. Uh, 
characterizing the the Standeschat of Engelbert as Austrofascismus, fascism. I hate that phrase. It's 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 uh, as they say, poisoning the well. You know, my uh, um, my little joke is: if you're going to say Austrofascism, you might as well talk about Renner Nazism. After all, Karl Renner, the leader of the socialists, collaborated very openly with the Nazis. And, you know, when I mention this here, I've had people say, well, you, you, you can't really say that. Uh, I mean, after all, uh, was Adolphus a fascist? And I respond, well, no, he was murdered by the Nazis. It was Renner that collaborated with them. Somehow, well, well, that's never really uh, so, appreciated. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. Go on, go on. The thing is, we have to use these words in the ways that they... Sorry? No, I was going to say, we have to use these words in precise ways. And the worst thing you do uh, is just use them to characterize people you don't like. You know, everyone so, I, I don't agree with is not necessarily a Marxist. <laughs> Just because I don't agree with them, but well, so say, there, there's a thing. Yeah, so uh, there is a thing. Uh, is there a way that there can be a a modern republic that is uh, integralist or that is uh, legitimist in nature? Well, first integralist, then legitimist. Or is no way. And in my country, we had this president in our foundation called uh, Gabriel Garcia Moreno, who was a who was a very conservative conservative Catholic. So, I think that that could be an example of it, or uh, of an integralist, uh, or at least a monarchist presidency in a, in a republic. Oh, yeah, I, I'm yeah, not no, hearing you. Uh, All right. A very heroic figure. Uh, All right, go on, go on, go on. Your 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 audio is fine. Right, we're flitting in and out. Please remember to use that microphone. It it really does help me hear you. All right. Uh, do you do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Perfect. All right. So uh, my question was if. Uh, if there was a way that a republic could be could be integralist or could be a legitimist, and well, the example I was using was that in my in my country in Ecuador we had a president who was a, a very conservative Catholic, Gabriel Garcia Moreno, and some people have have characterized him as being an integralist. So, oh well, he was a he was a a monarchist as well. So my question is that. If there were, there could be a way to to mix the republican and uh, and the integralist and legitimist uh, aspects of of a political system. Well, that's a very good question. Well, firstly, Garcia Moreno was a, a great hero, and uh, I would go so far as to say something of a martyr. The problem, and he saw it, he was a monarchist himself. The uh, problem with the republic, bear in mind, really, a millennia and three quarters at least of Catholic monarchy behind us. There has never been a Catholic republic that lasted very long. Um, part of the inherent instability of republics. And of course, what do you what do you mean by a republic? The, uh, you could talk about the Venetian Republic, for instance, which lasted a thousand years. But it wasn't a republic in the modern sense, especially because not only was it uh, internally a monarchy, but it held itself to be subject first to the Byzantine and then to the Holy Roman Empire. Um, republics, in the sense that we mean, are the creation of the 18th century. And no, there has never yet been a successful Catholic Republic that has lasted for any length of time. Uh, you can look at people like Garcia Moreno, you look at Lucas Salomon in Mexico, uh, you can look at Carrera in Guatemala, uh, you look at guys like this. 
uh, and if they weren't monarchists themselves, they were forced to act like monarchs when they were in power. And then the succession vanished. There was no stability at the end of the day. Um, contrary, I think a lot of North Americans, I think that there you'll see a lot of value in many and many a Latin American caudillo. But it couldn't last. There was no no way to keep it going after. And well, uh, Donoso Cortez told, uh, well, wrote in his books that the, the caudillo was a was a natural figure in all in all caudillo, movements, all political caudillo. movements. All oh, right, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the microphone problem again. So uh, Donoso Cortez, in his study of, of dictatorship, he said that, that the caudillo figure was a natural, a natural leader for any political problem. That that even the most egalitarian movements would have a caudillo of their own. Uh, do you think that a caudillo, in a in the broader sense, not the caudillo who was Franco, uh, could be a, a great figure figurehead be, before a monarch in in a particular political system? Well, it's possible. I mean, the thing is that the problem with Caudi with Caudillos, uh, as is with any self made individual, is that it tends to go to their heads. Uh, they think, you know, well, I've, I've put myself here. Um, I'm in charge now. We'll do things my way. To be able to surrender power to someone else is a difficult thing to do. Uh, this is, I mean, the whole reason one had monarchy in the first place was to ensure an orderly session that went along a certain groove. You know, I, I'll tell you mm -hmm. a true... Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll tell you a true and oh, funny story. Uh, George Washington, of course, was the leader of the American army during our, our, our revolution and our first civil war. And when the war ended, they, uh, a lot of people wanted him to become um, uh, king or dictator. He refused, and he went back to his farm. And George III, when he got the news of this, and mind you, George III was the king against whom Washington had rebelled. George III said, if this is true, then General Washington is the greatest man of the age because he was able to give up control. And that, that is the problem with the, uh, you know, and again, you, you, have, you have the problem of the succession. I mean, look, if you will, with anybody from uh, Loriano Gomez, uh, Peron, uh, uh, gosh, my mind is going, uh, the man in Chile, heavens. Uh, I know his name as well as my own. You know, he overthrew Allende. Uh, help me out. I can't, I got blank. Pinochet. Oh, <laughs> uh, Pinochet, Pinochet, yeah. But he, he never truly uh, relinquished power. Well, he, he kind of uh, gave more liberty to, to the rest of the political system to, to be able to do... No, uh, P Pinochet never really uh, rel relinquished any power because he stayed as, as head of the armed forces uh, until his death. Well, that's, that's very true. And, you know, again, in the case of someone like Pinochet, um, They attend, you know, they, they surrender power to a, to a system that basically is very much like what they took it from. And the, all, of the, all of the problems that were there before, they don't go away. I, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm thinking with, the, with horror of the celebrations in Buenos Aires right now. You don't have to be... Oh, you're broken up. I don't even know if you can hear me. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. I hear you. I have, I have some connection issues myself now. Well, no worry. I, I hear you. Uh, can you? All right. So the thing is that um, the, 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 the 
republic as we know it is inherently unstable. The Caudillo who takes power from it, uh, for him to either repair things or to surrender power to a king, it's very, very difficult. And in the case, the one, the one well, all right, two uh, examples that one can think of in history. One was Franco and the other was General Monk, who uh, overthrew Cromwell's son and gave power back to the king, Charles II. Um, there were mixed results. Uh, I have a, I have a last question. Oh yeah, yeah. Go and go finish. Some people are saying that perhaps uh, Putin and Russia. <laughs> we're having a lot of of connection issues and and microphone issues today. All right. No, now now we're back. So I had I had this last question, and that was if uh, if in the traditional Catholic order uh, there was a way a, a republic in the modern sense, at least uh, one that has elections and that has uh, some kind of of an elective uh, now of an elective system could uh, could work. And uh, well, there are the the examples of both Venice and uh, and Genoa in Italy. So. Uh, Well, again, the problem with both Genoa and Venice uh, in comparing them to a modern state is that, number one, the Catholic Church occupied the same role there that they did with hereditary monarchies. And most elective monarchies didn't do very well. Poland comes to mind. The Holy Roman Empire became hereditary de facto. Venice and Genoa... Uh, their elected heads could only come from a very small, small number of families. So they were oligarchic. They weren't republics in the sense of them. Uh, and as I say, their doges, their dukes, as they called them, uh, considered themselves as vaguely subordinate to the Holy Roman Emperor. So they weren't republics, again, in the sense that we think of them. I mean, Part of the problem is that we've all been raised in republics and we'd like to somehow baptize them and redeem them. And that's understandable. It's, it's, it makes perfect sense. The problem is it doesn't work. Not in the long run. Uh, I mean, I, I think of uh, the Irish Republic, which when I was a boy, the Irish Republic was touted as a great example of a Catholic Republic. Yeah, the only country in the world where abortion and gay marriage was brought in uh, uh, through popular election, not through uh, judicial fiat. So much for Catholic. Again, uh, I've had Argentina pointed out to me as a good example of a Catholic Republic. Happy abortion in Argentina. Oh, You're trying to fit to a structure of the environment the Enlightenment, you tried to make it, and it doesn't very well. All right. Oh, oh wait, wait, wait a sec, wait a sec. So, well, the, the problem is that the modern system itself, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't work with, uh, with the traditional concepts, right? No. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, I have. Yeah, this is the last question because I've been uh, I've been thinking about it for a very long time, and is that well, one uh, very great uh, traditional writer and and scholar was uh, Eric von Kunet Ledin, who was an Austrian. Yeah, uh, he he called himself himself a liberal, but he wasn't the, uh, uh, the same kind of liberal as uh, the ones that we know today in the United States, or even uh, well, no. he was more. He was closer to, to our modern libertarians, in a sense, and he was very conservative. So uh, what kind of liberalism he was talking about? I, I think that it's not about liberalism as a, as a political concept, but liberalism as practicing, practicing uh, liberality, which is a virtue. Well, his liberalism, well, firstly, let me say this about liberal and conservative. You know, they're, they're not very useful. 
uh, for one thing, what we Americans call liberals, the traditionally, it's a bit traditionally the Europeans and the Latin Americans and even the Canadians called socialists. What we called communists, everybody else called liberals. And what everyone else called conservatives, we don't have, not as an organized force, not since the revolution. We are a liberal republic. And in our origins, we, we were an aristocratic republic. Uh, that is to say, like most revolutions, the people who already had most of the power took it all. And that's why, you know, you look at who the four wealthiest men in the college were in 1775. They were George Washington, John Hancock, Philip Schuyler, and, uh, Philip Schuyler and Charles Carroll of Carrollton. I mean, this, this was, as most revolutions are, a revolution from the top. But they were very able men. They were very well-educated men. They were the closest thing we had to an aristocracy. And so they established... In their minds was an aristocratic republic last long and i think it's interesting that we have never yet a generation as brilliant as the founders we have gone slowly downhill i mean, I mean that in a nice way of course but i um i suppose the 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 thing with eric for the dean is is that he associated a great deal with American conservatives, self-proclaimed, especially the variety that are called paleocons. And they're a mixed group. Some of them are really Catholic conservatives uh, in an almost European, Latin American sense. Uh, some of them are Southern agrarians, you know, supporters of, in a sense, of the old Confederacy. Um, a very mixed bunch. But unfortunately today, God bless you. You you understand you might Thank be spreading COVID through the through the wires. Just COVID. <laughs> All right. If I can, maybe um, maybe I should put on my mask. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Will I? Be mm. uh, so uh, Eric von Kunet Ledin, he was a. Um, well, he was a, an interesting mix because he was very pro pro individual freedoms and pro pro free markets, but his concept was more closely associated with the with the ones of local liberties of, of fueros. Well, yeah, and and he uh, one thing to bear in mind is the tradition in Europe. Uh, liberals were considered to be adherents of the free market. And conservatives were held to be those who uh, believed more in state intervention. And this is of a pre-socialist variety. So, for instance, the liberals supported the abolition of the guilds and things like that because they felt that it interrupted the free flow of the market and so on. Uh, and this is another reason why the, uh, the so-called Manchester School in England which were the great apology for free trade, industrialism, and all that. They were considered liberals. So these terms can be very, very fluid, um, and they can mean almost anything these days. You know, again, I've, I've had this discussion with uh, some of my school chums here as to what, what it is one really, really wants. I mean, if you say conservative, well, okay, what are you trying to conserve? There are a lot of people in church and state right now who are trying to conserve 1968. Well, that's nice if you were a hippie, I guess. But if not, it not that great. Uh, reactionary. Well, what are you reacting to? And that's certainly not very positive. It doesn't mean you've got any ideas of your own. Restorationist? All right, what are you trying to restore? And, and so it goes, you see. Uh, you, you've um, oh, oh, now you're, you're frozen. No, we're we're having again. No, yeah, I, we're having again the. 
Yeah, you're frozen as well. We're having we're having a little of trouble. So uh, th I think that was my my last question because well, we've been talking we've been talking a lot about about all of these topics, which all relate one way or another to to political traditionalism and to monarchy. <laughs> So please use yeah. your, your, your microphone. Oh, my, my microphone again, 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 my microphone. So we've talking about, uh, we've been talking about all of these topics, which relate one way or another to, to political traditionalism and to, and to monarchism. So uh, it's been great because I wanted this to be uh, kind of the last video of the year, and uh, well, integralism and legitimism has always been some of my favorite personal topics and so i want to to thank you very much because uh, you've been a, a great source of of information for me to to understand this more well you know it's very important that people begin to explore these ideas pull them up again out of obscurity look at them look at these figures look at garcia moreno look at uh, oh i don't know uriburu in argentina Look at Loreano Gomez in Colombia. Uh, look at Lucas Salomon in Mexico. Look at... Uh, it, it doesn't mean that everything every one of these guys ever said, Charles Moraes or Dolfus or, or uh, the, inter, the Intergalistas, or, it doesn't mean that everything they said was absolute gospel. But pull them up and look at them again. See what they've got to offer. Uh, Attilio Mordini in Italy. Uh, Vuti in the Netherlands, and I, they just go on and on and on. There were a ton of these characters that we haven't heard of. And one of the uh, one of the things I'm contemplating is a guide to this kind of thinking, to, the, to these sorts of because no one's heard of them anymore. And, and they're not, if you know who you're looking for, they're easy to find. Their material is now easy to find on the net. And with the uh, miracle of Google Translate and a ton of other uh, similar services, You could read the, you could read all sorts of languages that you have no no knowledge of, and again, it is important, but you'll get a gist for what it is they're saying. You, 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 and that I think, before, before we can really figure out where we're going to go from here, we need to see where we've been. We need to avoid reinventing the wheel. Uh, again, it's up to your generation to dig up these figures and pull out of them what was valuable. Look clearly and carefully at the situation we find ourselves in and move accordingly. What's definitely certain is that the generation of 68 who dominated us in church and state and my generation really, although I'm a junior member, I was just a boy when it all happened. Nevertheless, <laughs> uh, we've really, we're really right the whole thing into the ground <laughs> to be to be brilliant. Uh, and you lads and lassies are going to have to pick it up and do something with it. And as the most recent thing in Argentina shows, uh, you know, it, it's like when the Supreme Court here uh, just ruled in favor of euthanasia, you know, allowing families or their, their uh, older people. One of my Austrian classmates said to me, When is this going to end? And I laughed. Only end when it stopped. You know, why shouldn't it now? And it can only stop when the ideas, first when the ideas are out there, and secondly, when the ideas create action. When what is now a sentiment becomes a cause, that's when things will change. Until then, We're going to continue to go down the road we're going. And that's a road of, of dominance and submission. Our masters are dominant and we submit. I'm very happy to, of course. <laughs> I'm very obedient to my masters and I trust you'll be too. <laughs> I think we I think we are we are becoming the, the true rebels in, in our age. Because uh, first of all, we're not complying with with the ideas that they are telling us to to adopt, and we're exploring more. I I recently wrote a piece called uh, "Liberal Liberalism," in which uh, I talked about this that 
using the, the label of liberals that the liberals were were the true liberals the true liberals nowadays because they they were the ones who were exploring liberally all ideas and, and trying to to get a, a different path for for our future at least politically and well i think this is this is the way <laughs> And I'm very thankful because uh, we've been meeting with people like you and we've been exploring ideas and we've been uh, making sense of, of the current world with, uh, with what was known before, before the modern age came. So uh, thank you very much. And well, it's been great to, to have you on the channel again. So thanks very much. And I'll just say that you know, whether we like it or not, you can jump up and down about how terrible globalism and all that is. But it is. The very fact that we're having a show like despite our technical issues, this, you cannot imagine what to someone of age, what a bizarre wonder this is. <laughs> and now yeah. we're in a position to explore one of uh, histories and cultures and so forth and apply them in a way that simply could never have been done before. So it's a world, it's an age of wonders. That's why I would ask you, what period would you like to have lived in? I say this one. Yes, this is, I think it's a, it's a blessing because uh, even if we're seeing a lot of problems, we're still benefiting from, from some of the, of the aspects of, of this age. And in a sense, it's not even bad. I mean, we could be better, and we have to be better, but uh, at least on a on a technological level, we're not bad. We're we're very well right now. Yeah. So, it just let's hope it never is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and I hope to see you next year. And uh, Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and God bless you, Mister Coulomb. God bless you. Feliz Navidad. Uh, bon, uh, Año nuevo. <laughs> Prosper año nuevo. Goodbye, Mr. Colomb. Thank you very much. Adios.